Good morning, Oakwood. Glad that you're here today for our Grad Sunday. And uh, the title of today's message is Don't Ruin Your Life by 30. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. But uh, on this topic of, of youth, I mean, didn't the youth do a great job this morning? I mean, man. I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's, there's churches that wish their adult worship team was that good. So praise the Lord, uh, church is in good hands for the next many years uh, uh, with, our, with our youth. And uh, on that topic of youth, uh, many of you know we've been without a youth minister for months. And uh, Tuesday night, uh, we had our uh, last candidate accept the position. And so Justin and Amanda Brody have accepted that call to come be youth ministers here at Oakwood. So we are excited about that. Now there's their picture, Justin, Justin and Amanda, and they have uh, two, two girls, uh, they, they have Hope that's three, and they have Brecklin, uh, who is uh, like five months, and so uh, they're going to be uh, coming here really soon, uh, his goal is to go to middle school camp, which leaves June 9th, so uh, they're looking for a house to rent right now, and so we're, we're just trying to help them with arrangements and getting them settled in here, but uh, looking forward to a long, fruitful uh, ministry with, with Justin and with his family. And so uh, thank you for your prayers and support during this time. Thank you to all the youth sponsors, um, what they have done in the interim period, teaching and, and keeping things going. And uh, we're just excited to uh, get, get, the, get the ball moving there. And so uh, it, it, it's very exciting for us. I want to begin today with a word of prayer and just ask the Lord to speak to us as we have uh, so many times this year. Uh, just pray that God would speak to your heart this morning. So if you would, just bow your heads and just pray that prayer. Lord, today, speak to me. And believing that, all God's people said, amen, amen, and we expect him to speak to us this morning. Now, the title of the message, again, is Don't Ruin Your Life by 30, but I don't want you to tune me out if you're over 30, because as I was sharing some of these ideas with the staff this week, they're like, man, I know a lot of 30-year-olds that could use some of this stuff, and then I had somebody else comment, I know a lot of 40-year-olds that could use some of this stuff, and so, uh, again, it's from the scriptures, it's principles, it's universal appeal, so I'll, I'll be talking kind of to the graduates and to, uh, to the youth and, and to uh, young people today, uh, but don't, don't, don't miss out on the application for your life, because uh, we're going to be going through it this morning. Now, there's a lot of scripture this morning, a lot of godly wisdom that's going to be imparted from the Bible, so it's going to kind of feel like uh, drinking from a fire hose this morning, so you're welcome to open that Bible, I love hearing the rustle of pages and um, getting in the scriptures, but they're also going to be on the screen for you this morning, but we really invite you to follow along in the app. So if you download the Oakwood app, you can go to Oakwood Enid um, in either uh, the Google Play Store or the, uh, the uh, um, Apple Mac Store. Uh, if you go to the app store there, just, down, just search Oakwood Enid, download the app, you can go to sermon notes and all the, the bullet points and all the scriptures are right there for you. There's even ways for you to interact on there and take notes for yourself. So uh, but I want to just really think about the season that these graduates are in. I mean, do you remember being there at one point in your life that, that uh, you felt like the whole world was in front of you? Um, and, and it was an exciting time. And I remember being really excited upon high school graduation for about a week. And then I remember spending the rest of my summer being really scared. And being really fearful about what does the future hold? Now, my plans were established a couple years before I graduated in that I just felt the call of God on my life to um, go into ministry. And, and I was uh, intended to go into youth ministry and be a youth minister. And, and so uh, that was the path that I was on. I was going to Bible college. You think, well, that's a good place to be out of your home your first year is Bible college. But Bible college has sinners too. Did you know that? There's temptation even at Bible college, you know? Um, but, but just to go off into the world and, 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 and to have that, that little bit of anxiety about what does the future hold? And I remember what kept me grounded and what gave me hope all the way through it was my relationship with the Lord. And, and being in the Word every day, reading those Scriptures, and, and being able to pray to God and turn things over to God uh, was really what grounded uh, me through those times. And I think for many of you that walk with the Lord, you know that those are the kind of things that maybe have grounded you. And so uh, don't let uh, this idea of that this ruining life by 30 uh, pass these principles by you if this applies to you today at whatever age and stage of life that you're in. But I'm going to speak specifically to that group this morning. If you don't want to ruin your life by 30, then I'm going to give you some wisdom from the Scriptures today. And I'm going to be straight up and straightforward with you this morning. The first thing is this. If you don't want to ruin your life by 30, then understand that causes have effects. The actions have reactions. 
that choices have consequences, so make good God-guided decisions. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, it says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. That we're actually supposed to count life on this earth as finite, as there is a final chapter to life in this world and life on this, on this earth. And then we're going to go to heaven. And so while we're here, we're to seek and have a heart of wisdom and gain that from the Lord and be smart that we're only here for a short time on earth in light of eternity. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 17, it says, He is on the path of life who heeds instruction, who actually listens to instruction. But he who forsakes reproof goes astray. You ever been there in your life? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 says this, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in, in the end, it's, it is the way of death. You know, that's the way the devil works sometimes. Is he wants you to live your life a certain way, and it seems right, it seems okay, but in the end, it leads to death. You know, we always make choices, but we always need to make those choices with the end in mind. So many times I think we're going through life and we're making choices, we think about what it affects today or what it affects in the next hour, what it affects maybe tomorrow, but we don't think, how is this going to affect me 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And the reality is, if you're a young person today and you're under 30, that even at your age now, you will make decisions that will affect you the rest of your life. And there are people in their 40s and 50s who are haunted by decisions that they made in their late teens or early 20s. And so we need to remember that the decisions you make today will determine your future tomorrow. So the scripture would say, be wise, make good God-honoring choices. Or you may have to suffer the consequences of your bad ones. The second thing this morning, if you don't want to ruin your life by 30, is to seek to understand God's purpose for your life. If you've never come to that time in your life where you've asked the question, why am I here? What what is my purpose in life? Why do I exist? What is my purpose in the world? We all need to come to that part in our life and, and, and reckon that with God and really wrestle with that. What on earth am I here for? You must understand that there's a very high and an eternal purpose for your existence. That just as Adam and Eve were created in the garden to have a relationship with God, so all mankind that came after them are also created to have a relationship with God. And when you come to the end of your life, guess what? That's all that matters. Your relationship with anything else in this world doesn't matter at that point. It's only a relationship with God. And we need to remember that even the fact that we have life is from the Lord. Look what it says in John chapter 1, verse 3. It says, through him, talking about God, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. You see, he created you. He loves you. And he wants you to love him. He wants you to have a relationship with him and to worship him. And see, this kind of got messed up for us way back in the garden. I mean, God gave Adam and Eve what? One rule. One guideline, don't eat of this one tree. But man made a sinful choice as the devil tempted him and said, oh, really? Do you really think you shouldn't eat off that tree? Maybe God's holding out on you. Maybe you're missing out on this wonderful life on the other side of this. So eat this fruit. And we took the bait, didn't we? We listened to Satan. And ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, so mankind has struggled with sinfulness. You think, well, that's it. We, we broke the relationship with God. We broke it. How are we going to get it back there? But God did not stop there. He pursued this relationship with us. And if you read Genesis through Revelation, if you read the entire Bible, the whole Bible is about this story. It's about his pursuit of you, his pursuit of me. Because God didn't stop there after the garden and pass judgment on the world. He continued to pursue that relationship with us. And he did so even further in this thing we call the New Testament where it brings up that Jesus, the Son of God, was brought into the world and that that God himself sacrificed Jesus, his Son, to redeem that relationship with us again. But we have a choice to make in this. We choose that relationship or we choose not to have it. But because he loves you and because he wants you, he sacrificed his Son. And that never changes. Look what it says in Psalm 139. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, and you know when I rise, and you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Kind of scary, isn't it? 
Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. And you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. And for you, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And then at the end of that chapter, the writer says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. You see, God's purpose for life is not that you'd cut him out. It's not that you would live your life in compartments and say, well, this is my Sunday compartment, so I bring God out on Sunday, and I love Jesus on Sunday, but I live however I want to live the rest of, our, rest of the week. No, God's intent and purpose is that you'd walk with him all of the days of your life. This wouldn't be something you just do on Sundays, or, or maybe if you're in a small group on a Tuesday night, or maybe you come to church on a Wednesday, but this is something you would live out all of your life. You see, Jesus is the way of life, and all people that you look up to in your life, all of those people that seem to have it together, and you look at their life, and you're like, man, I want what they have. Man, I love that their marriage is what I want. Their kids, that's what I want for my kids. You know, their, their relationship, and they just so have so much peace and calm, and my life feels so messed up and, and in constant turmoil. When you look at those people, I guarantee it's because of their relationship with the Lord. It's because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Those families and those situations that you look up to, are because they have chosen God's way instead of their own. You need to wrestle with this purpose question. And remember that you exist on earth to get ready for eternity. So it doesn't matter if you're 18 years old, if you're 22, if you're 32, 42, 82. You need to know and love and serve Jesus always. Because if you do that, heaven awaits. But he wants to have that relationship with us. He wants us to love him and to worship him. That is God's purpose for your life. So we need to seek to understand the purpose. If you don't want to ruin your life by 30, then you need to learn to take responsibility for your actions. I call it owning your stuff. You know, we need to quit blaming everyone else for our stuff, right? I mean, your issues are your issues. Own them. I have issues. You have issues. Guess what? Everyone has issues. And if they think they don't, that's their issue. It's denial, okay? It's denial. But some people, they like to blame others for their issues. They get in what I call victim mode, and they're the victim of what somebody said about them. They're in the victim mode of what somebody did to them. They're in the victim mode of, of, of their circumstances or, or what their parents did to them when they were a kid or, or all of these things. And sometimes it creates this situation where you just don't like to look at your, your stuff or yourself. And some people take it a step further. They don't like to look at themselves so much that they will try to blame others and get others to accept responsibility for what they have chosen to do. But we, I think we all just need to get to this place where we take responsibility for our actions and we own it and then we work on it with God's help. God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to stay the way that we are. He wants to redeem us and take us to a new way in life. And I'm, I'm talking to, to young people this morning. This is the way. This is the way. Take responsibility for your actions and let God do his work in your life. Now, another thing, just as a side note, but it goes along with taking responsibility, is you need to be super careful on social media. You need to think before you post. I was just reading a, uh, some posts on uh, social media last night, and I'm t here to tell you this morning, venting is not healthy. Venting is not healthy. It is passive aggressive. For you to go out online and vent about a person that you're mad at, what would scripture tell you to do? Go to the person you have a problem with and be mad at them face to face. But no, instead, we're going to talk and rant and get everybody to go, hey, you know, we, we like what you said negative about that person. And it just goes on and on and on. And it's starting to affect people's lives now. Did you know that Facebook is in 85% of divorce cases when they're brought 85% have something to do with Facebook. Makes you think, what is really going on there when we're ranting or trying to hurt someone else or trying to shed our illness online instead of dealing with it the way God would have us to deal with it? Take responsibility for your actions. Look what it says in Proverbs 28, 13. It says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces, owns their stuff, to them finds mercy. So own your stuff, take responsibility for your actions. Sounds really simple, 
much, much harder to do. If you don't want to ruin your life by, by 30, then number four, you need to look at your unique strengths and giftings when choosing a vocation. Every calling is honorable before God. Whatever your intentions are for your future is honorable before God if you choose to use it for him. Because God wants his children and his people to minister to everyone, everywhere. That's the call of the Great Commission, to go into the world and to share the gospel with everyone. And so that's why God wants bankers and nurses and teachers and cooks and drivers, technicians, coaches, mechanics, attorneys, military, retail managers, and the list could go on and on. He wants Christians in all of those places to infiltrate, to shine his light in all the darkness in every place of life, to infiltrate the world with the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's another way in life, and it's a relationship with God. Matthew 28 says it, go into all the world and make disciples. So many times I think we think, well, we're going to all the world. we got to go to a third world country. Yes, that's important. We need to be doing that because we are called to go to all the world. But sometimes you're more willing to send it to the third world country than you are to send it to work or to send it to the soccer club or to to send send it to this group that you're a part of or to share it on Sunday afternoon with a bunch of guys shooting clay pigeons. And it says that the gospel is supposed to go everywhere and so look at your look at your unique strengths and giftings and choose a vocation and when you do that dedicate it to the Lord the fifth thing if you don't want to ruin your life by 30 is to hold in high regard what the Bible says about sex and about marriage I'm going to be straight up with you about this stuff this morning the fastest way to ruin your life is to have sex outside of the bond of marriage period I could take time to give you stats this morning and tell you all the statistics on that. I could sit here and tell you painful, painful stories. I I could show you this morning how many lives are messed up by this. You could actually read the Bible and read about a bunch of them. I could show you messed up families. I could show you messed up kids. I can show you generational sins that are passed on from mothers and fathers making those choices to the third and fourth generation of a family. I can show you emotional distress. I can show you emotional scarring. I can show you physical issues and diseases. There's so much we could say about this, but I would just simplify it by saying this. Hold in high regard what the Bible says about sex and marriage and actually do it. And understand, the most important decision you will ever make in your life is whether you're going to give your life to Jesus Christ. Most important decision every person will make in their life is, am I going to follow Jesus all of the days of my life? Am I going to will my human will over to his heavenly will and call him Savior and Lord? And then the second most important decision is what? The second most important decision you will ever make is whether you're going to divorce your spouse. Wait, that's not what you guys, that's probably not what you thought I was going to say You thought the second most important decision that you will ever make was who you're going to marry. But I think that's changed in the last 30 years. Perhaps you were thinking that was it. It used to be that way. I remember it as a child. When people got married, they got married for life until one of them passed away. In fact, it was that way really for most people for a few thousand years. But in today's culture of convenient divorce, you need to decide before you ever get married what kind of commitment you're willing to make to another person. Will you and your potential spouse marry for life? Or will you just marry till it gets hard? Marry to, for when it's convenient, but not maybe be as committed when it's not easy. You see, things have gotten so bad in our country that honestly, if we're being honest this morning, it's easier to divorce your spouse than it is to fire someone that works for you. I said that first service and I must have had some business owners or managers or something because there was a collective groan like, yeah, you know, that's right. It's probably easier to get a divorce than it is to fire someone who's underperforming at work. But let me share with you this morning some rules for dating and for marriage. The first one is this, and we've talked about this, is get married for life. Okay, if you don't have a vision that you could see your per, yourself with this person 50 years from now, then I wouldn't even think about even dating them. Because when you make that marriage commitment, it needs to be for life. That needs to be, that needs to be what is on your mind. That is what God intended, and that's what you have to strive for. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying it's not hard work. I mean, Amy still loves you. We're still married. That's hard work. If you know me, it's hard work. 
But we're dedicated to each other. We made that commitment together. Get married for life. Another rule for dating and marriage is keep your hands to yourself. This one would be for, for more for the dating. Keep your hands to yourself. Look what it says here in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, one through eight. It says, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to do what? To please God as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That means that you would become like Christ. That you should avoid what? Sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy, in a way that is honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So straight to the point here, what it's saying is there's no sexual and moral behavior before or during marriage. Now I'll talk to the guys here for just a second this morning. Guys, if you're not married, you are expected to honor uh, younger women as sisters in the Lord in all purity. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 5. Okay, your girlfriend is not your wife, and you are not free physically to be involved with her. The scripture says that she is your sister in Christ and that you would treat her with all purity. Now, I want you to think about this morning. Who is possibly dating your future spouse right now? Now, some of you think, well, I am, and maybe, maybe you are. Maybe you are dating your f- future spouse, but statistically it says it's far more likely that someone else is dating your future spouse right now. And it is more than likely that you are dating someone else's future spouse right now. And that's why some of you could say, I've had boyfriends or girlfriends because you've had multiple boyfriends or girlfriends. But guys, how do you want the guy that's dating your future wife right now, how do you want him to treat her? Would it bother you if he held her hand? What if they kissed Would that bother you? I mean, would you round up a posse and, you know, go meet that guy and say, hey, hey, now listen here. For some of you, you may say, well, it doesn't matter so much, but maybe it probably depends on how he's kissing your future wife or maybe where he's kissing your future wife. And you might be dating someone else's future wife. Why don't you treat that lady the way you would like for your future wife to be treated? And the best guy that I can give you is just Keep your hands to yourself. Stay pure. Another guideline here for marriage and and, and really for dating is don't act cheap. Okay? Don't act cheap. If you belong to Christ, Christ values you so much. Value yourself as much as Christ does. As much as his blood was shed to redeem you, it cost him his life. So if you belong to Christ, you shouldn't act cheap or dress cheap. Ladies, dress modestly. You can be in style and still be modest. I know it's getting harder today. I have three daughters. So I speak from experience. But have some real morals and values for yourself. You know, the kind of guys that you're going to attract by being scantily clad are not the types of guys you want to bring home to meet mom and dad. And honestly, they're probably not the type of guys that you want a future with. Trust me in this. And ladies, I would say this to you as well. Don't settle. Don't settle. Don't don't do the things that are making you uncomfortable. Set those guidelines and those parameters from Scripture and stick to them. Just because a guy says that he loves you doesn't mean that you need to give him permission to touch you in some way. If he really loved you, he'd respect you, and he'd do letter B. Keep his hands to himself. Letter D. I won't spend much time on this. No sleepovers, ever. This includes living together. Okay, that, that's for uh, 10-year-olds and, and birthday parties, that kind of thing. So Ephesians 5.3 says this, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. It says that these are improper for God's holy people. That there wouldn't even be a hint of it. And so don't, don't come to me, well, you know, I sleep on the couch, and she's, you know, it's too tempting. Don't put yourself in those situations. Um, man, you want to ruin your life by 30, just 
no, no sleepovers. Last thing here is Christians only marry other Christians. Christians only marry other Christians. And you may, you may think about this, but you want a foundation there that's going to last for life. Solid. Level. True. And if you truly love Christ, why in the world would you marry someone who doesn't? If you truly love Jesus Christ and you're dedicated your life and you're, to him, why, how could you marry someone who doesn't value him at all? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says this, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. In other words, don't make a committed um, yoking together with, with people who do not believe what you believe about Jesus Christ or who have not called him Savior and Lord. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? I just want to tell you this morning, and you're asking for trouble and misery if, if you violate this scripture. Trust me, lifelong committed misery. Most divorces of Christians happen because they're unequally yoked. And when one person is moving God's way and the other person is moving the way of the world, you can see the gap that happens in the middle. And some of you, I know you're wondering this morning, you may be uh, getting out of high school, you may be getting out of college, you may be in your 20s, maybe even your 30s, and some of you may still wonder, this, this is your question, right? How will I know when I meet the right person? Well, just trust me in this. If you're praying about it and you're bringing it before the Lord, you will know. You'll know. It'll be like something you've never experienced before, and you'll know. And you'll be able to test them by the fruit of the Spirit in their life, and you'll know. But I want to speak to some others this morning, because I think it's something that we don't think about sometimes. What if God's plan for your life is not to be married? I want to tell you this morning, it is better to be single and content than married and miserable. It's better to be single and content than married and miserable. There's some scriptures in the Bible that talk about that. And there's some people that can attest to that. Because sometimes we go into marriage and we think, well, marriage is going to fulfill me. You know, yeah, that's what it's about. It's about being fulfilled. My marriage will not fulfill you. Scripture says God will fulfill you. Marriage cannot meet your deepest needs. Only God can meet your deepest needs. So you really want to, wouldn't want to put those expectations on another human anyway. Because they'll never live up. So we need to remember Christians only marry other Christians. And the last thing this morning, if you don't want to ruin your life by 30, is never stop learning and gaining wisdom. Leaders are learners. And when you quit learning, you quit leading. I even think sometimes it's just reading. Reading the Scriptures. Reading is leading. Because readers are leaders. Why? Because they embrace learning and when you read this book, you embrace the wisdom of Almighty God, who the Scripture says his thoughts, his thoughts are higher and better than ours. Read the Bible. And don't just read it to check a box. Read it for understanding. If you don't understand something, ask someone. I have someone right now that uh, sends me an email every few weeks with a question because he's reading Scripture and he's wanting to understand, what does this mean? What, what does this word mean? What you know? And I love it because you're searching and you're digging and you're in this pursuit. You're on a journey where you're never going to stop learning. You're never going to stop gaining wisdom. And seek wise counsel as you go through life. When those big decisions come up facing you, and take godly advice to heart. Proverbs 15.22 says this, Plans fail for a lack of counsel, but with many advisors... They succeed. So never stop learning or gaining wisdom from the Lord. As we close this morning, I want to leave you with this. It's a verse from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. Listen to what it says. And at first here, the writer is talking directly to God. He says this. He says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. That means they're set. Because they trust in you. And then in verse 4, he turns to us. And he tells us, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, 
The Lord himself is the rock eternal. And if you'll make that decision to yield your life to the rock eternal, to yield your life to Christ, to put him first in your life, then I want to tell you all of these other issues we've talked about today will take care of themselves. They'll take care of themselves. You see, the problem is so many people, they want Jesus, but they want him as Savior. Savior only. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. He got up on the, on the cross and he died for me. And, oh, I love Jesus. I love the fact that he rose from the grave and that I have hope of eternal life with him. I love him as Savior. But then we read all of this wisdom in Scripture. And it seems like he also wants to be in charge. He wants to be the Lord of our life. He wants lordship over your life. Not to just be a convenient savior. And that's the part, it seems, where we struggle. Can we really surrender our life and give it fully over to God? If you don't want to ruin your life by 30, then you need to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You need to make a lifetime commitment to him, and then you need to choose to walk in it. And you're going to have to choose. It's not like the devil lies down and is like, oh, I'm never going to tempt you ever again. He's going to keep the temptation rolling. But it's up to you. The choice is yours. And what does he say here? Trust in the Lord forever. Forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, he's the rock. He's the foundation of your life. He's the rock eternal. So we're not going to choose to trust in anything else in this world. We're only going to choose to trust in him. If you've never made that decision this morning, and you feel like, man, I've been moving my own way in life, maybe today is the day of turning. Today is the day of repentance, where you repent of your sin, and you turn toward God, you forsake that life that you've been going, and you say, you know what? I'm choosing a new way in life today. I'm choosing to follow Jesus. For maybe for some of you, you say, well, you know, I've made that decision before. I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. I, I, I tasted the watery grave of baptism years ago, but I've lost my way. Like in the last five, 10 years, I, I just lost my way and I need to get back there. I'll tell you what, God never stopped loving you. And just like the prodigal son, the father, while well, that son was still a long way off, was watching for him. And as soon as he turned and came home, it says the father ran to meet him. Why? Because he was looking for him. He was anticipating this might be when my son comes home. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you're outside of Christ, God wants to wrap his arms around you and love you and teach you the wisdom of his word so that you can have a good life now. So many people think, oh, God's some cosmic killjoy. You know, he's got all these rules. He's waiting for us to stumble. No, he gives us these guidelines because he loves us and he knows this is the best way to live. If you'll choose this way over the ways of the world, it's amazing what God can do with a re redeemed life. We're going to sing a song in just a moment, and we invite you, um, if you feel like the Lord's prodding you to a decision this morning, and, and, and you're like, man, I really want to talk to somebody about this, we have the decision room right over here, and we've got elders and decision guides that would love to pray with you, talk to you about anything maybe the Lord has put on your heart this morning. But we're going to sing and we're going to worship together and the youth are going to come back out and lead us. And we just invite you this morning. We just invite you to come. Just as you are, come. And, and answer and respond to the Lord Jesus and what he might be doing in you this morning.